We're going to continue in the book of James, so if you'll take your Bibles and join me in James chapter 1. We started into the book last week, and we only got the first eight verses of chapter 1, so I'm going to do a brief recap, and then we'll pick it up there at verse 9. But James chapter 1 is where we are. If you need a Bible tonight, our ushers have Bibles in their hands. They'll be glad to give you one if you need one. Reading now from the New King James Version. And uh, if you take a Bible from one of our ushers, James chapter 1 is found on page 1184 in those Bibles. So let me go through a a really quick recap here. If you weren't with us last Sunday, while you're finding your place there in James chapter 1, and uh, then we'll we'll pray and we'll carry on starting at verse 9. So here we go. Uh, The writer of the book of James is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, Jesus has uh, four half-brothers mentioned by name in Scripture, and he has sisters, plural, not mentioned by name, but plural means obviously two or more. So there were six, at least six, half-siblings that Jesus had. They all shared the same mother. Jesus, of course, had a different father. His father is God. And so the writer of this particular epistle is James, the half brother of Jesus, not James the apostle who was martyred uh, in Acts chapter 12. This James, the writer of the epistle by his name, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15. He was called Old Camel Knees because he was constantly on his knees in prayer, developed very ca- uh, calloused knees as a result. Tradition says that he was martyred in AD 62 by being thrown from the temple wall. The date of this book is roughly 50 AD. It is considered to be the earliest of all the New Testament epistles. It predates any of Paul's epistles by at least two years. The recipients of this letter, the original recipients, were Jews scattered throughout Asia Minor, talking most of Europe. And they were believers. They were Jews who were believers in Jesus as the Messiah. And the overall theme of this book is practical Christian living. More specifically, what we're gonna look at are these main themes. Trials and temptations. He also talks about faith and deeds, the relationship between faith and works. Remember I mentioned last week that Martin Luther had a problem with this book, because Martin Luther, being a, a monk in the Roman Catholic Church, was finally liberated when he read the book of Romans, that it's not by works are we saved. He realized that it's a matter of grace. You don't have to work your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. And so he left a very performance-oriented religion, comes to faith in Christ, reads the book of James, and calls it the epistle of straw. He didn't even think it should be included in the canon of Scripture because James talks about works. Luther wanted to, you know, run from works because works aren't required for salvation. Unfortunately, Luther didn't really understand, I suppose, if he's going to call it the epistle of straw, that what James is talking about is that works don't save you, but works show that you are saved. The way you live your life is a demonstration of your faith or the lack thereof. So there is a relationship between faith and works. James talks about it. He also talks a lot about speech. He's going to devote all of chapter 3 to the whole idea of the tongue. And he talks a little bit about it today if we can get to that part at the end of chapter 1. And then he's, he's got a section on wisdom. We talked a little bit about it last week. He's got more to say on wisdom And then he also talks about prayer. And he mentions in this whole topic of trials and temptations, category number one, he mentions that it is uh, something that trials happen and, and that they happen particularly for three reasons in our lives. Either for maturation, we grow because of it, or for correction, because, you know, we're doing something wrong and so we face trials because of our own deliberate wrong choices and sinful choices. Uh, And sometimes it's just for direction, where trials come not because of our sinful choices, but God uses trials to kind of redirect us uh, according to His his plan. And when when He talks about trials, and and, and in chapter 1, this is where we left off last week, He talks about trials and, and just, you know, how they can affect us. He talks about trials having a progressive nature. Uh, that, that testing comes, the trials come, and then it develops in us pa- patience, and then patience causes us to become mature and to become complete. And, and so uh, this, is, this is what he says in verse 
to. He says, my, my brethren, my brothers, uh, and a, a term that he uses 15 times in the letter, brothers, you know, sisters. He's talking about fellow believers. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, here's the progression, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. How many of you could use a little more patience? And only three people like raise their hands. How many could use a little more patience? You're like, well, I don't have enough patience to raise my hand. Okay, well, patience. We need patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. That's where NIV says mature and complete, not lacking anything, lacking nothing. So that's where we left off at the end of verse uh, eight, but that's the whole theme here of trials in the first section. He talks a little bit about wisdom there also in chapter one is if you lack wisdom, ask for it, but don't be double-minded. Don't, don't ask and then doubt. Um, believe and, and receive that God has wisdom for you. So that's where we left off at verse nine. I'm gonna pause and pray and then we'll dig out hopefully the rest of this chapter. Let's pray first. Father, thank you for your love in our lives and for your word tonight. It's so refreshing to be able to just come into your house and to open up our Bibles and to read truth in, at a time when truth is such a scarce commodity in our, in our culture, Lord. So many people wanting to know what is the truth. And so thank you, Lord, that we can just be refreshed in your presence tonight as we open up your word and, and read truth. And we pray that these things that James writes will challenge and encourage us. And we need it tonight. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So in verse nine, he says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Now, uh, one of the things I mentioned last week is that James does not necessarily write in a very ordered way. He, he talks about um, the issue of speech, and then he uh, talks about wisdom, and then he comes back to speech, and, and he's gonna talk about anger, and then he talks uh, about um, wealth, and then he comes back to anger. So he, he doesn't write in a very orderly way. He's just kind of you know throwing a lot of um, uh, really what ends up being Proverbs um, in this letter, and James is compared in the New Testament to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. Just very short, very succinct, very pithy kind of uh, uh, truisms. And when he speaks here about the lowly person, the, lo the lowly brother, he's talking about those who are lowly either in comparison to the rich because of their financial status or lowly in the sense of um, just being... Um, in a, in a bad place because of the trials that he's referring to earlier. And, and which either interpretation it is, he ends up talking about the lowly brother being exalted. And then he, and then he switches and he talks about the rich or the, or the guy who is high and how, how he can be humbled sometimes. And he, again, this is not, this is not you know, a criticism of being wealthy, the, the idea here is always that material things should not control us or define us. And because his point at the end of this section is just like the flowers fade, just like, uh, you know, th they're beautiful for a moment and then they perish, just like the grass withers, material stuff is short term and it has no lasting eternal value other than the way that you might use it for the, for the sake of the kingdom to bring glory to God and to advance the gospel. So we're to be good stewards of all that God has given us. Uh, wealth by itself is, is not the problem. It's, it's how we use it or abuse it. And so he talks here about the lowly brother glorying in his exaltation. In other words, basically what he's saying here is as much as it is appropriate for the lowly brother to rejoice when lifted up by God, it is appropriate for the rich to, to rejoice when he's humbled by God. Um, because 
uh, God wants us to recognize that he is Lord of all and that he is the provider of everything. And we have to be careful with these temporary things that we're entrusted with uh, because they can ruin us if we don't use what God has given us for the glory of God. Now, everything's relative. Uh, we live in Loudoun County, the wealthiest county in the nation. So we need to be particularly mindful uh, that God has entrusted a lot to us on average, comparatively speaking with the rest of the world. And so we need to be wise about what he's given us and we need to use it for the glory of God. We are living in, in the most lucrative place uh, in the United States and with that comes responsibility. How are we to use the resources that God has given us? How are we to use the material things that God has entrusted to us for the glory of God and for the betterment of the kingdom of God. And so that's his challenge here. Um, he, he's not saying the lowly is any better than the rich. He's not saying the rich is any better than the lowly. He's trying to put things in, in perspective for us. And then he goes into verse 12 by saying, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, and IV says when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, underline in your Bibles or highlight them in your electronic Bibles, crown of life. This is uh, the first time that crown of life is mentioned, but crown of life is also mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And between those two places, it's the only two places in the Bible where we read about the crown of life. In Revelation 2.10, it's the letter to the church of Smyrna. The Smyrna uh, church was the suffering church. And God was saying that when you persevere and when you endure through your suffering, you're going to receive the crown of life. And James talks about the crown of life here as well. You also read in the Bible, just for you note takers, the mention of the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4.8. That's another kind of crown, the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8. And Peter talks about the crown of glory in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. So between those places, you have here in James, the crown of life, also in Revelation 2.10. You have Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.8 about the crown of righteousness. And you have Peter talking about the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5.4. You have these three kinds of crowns that God's people will be rewarded on the day that we stand before him. Now, I don't know which crown you're going to be up for, and maybe all three but don't get too excited. Because here's what Revelation chapter four tells us, that when we're in the presence of the Lamb of God, when he's seated on the throne, we cast all our crowns at his feet. So you might go around saying, wow, I can't wait till I get that crown. You're gonna have it for like a nanosecond. <laughs> and it isn't that God's gonna say, okay, listen, give it up, give it up. It isn't gonna be that. It's going to be that you and I are so overwhelmed in the presence of the majesty and the glory of God that we're going to feel undone. And we're going to just be casting our crowns down. He isn't going to ask it of us. We're just going to feel so undone in his presence. We're going to be like, take the crown that you've just given me. So all these crowns are mentioned in the Bible, but none of them end up staying on our head. Okay, nobody's going to be walking. Can you imagine if, it, if they did stay on our head and people would be walking around heaven like, Wow, I'm trying to juggle three crowns on my head. What do you have? A oh, one? Oh, sorry. You know, I mean, <laughs> that isn't going to be happening in heaven. There's not going to be pride like that. So all the crowns go down at Jesus' feet, Revelation chapter 4. So we read about it and we go, wow, how nice would that be? Isn't going to last on your head very long, Burger King. <laughs> so we receive these crowns. Verse 13. Now he shifts here from the idea of trials, and he's gonna come now into the whole idea of temptations, which is a, tr a form of a trial, but of a different kind. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, circle that, I am tempted by God. He says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. All right, so let me summarize here 
uh, these verses, and actually on the screen it should say verse 13 through 15, not 14 through 15, because it's, it's all the section I just read there, verses 13, 14, and 15. And James is going to make these three points as it relates to temptation. The first is everyone faces temptation. If you notice there in verse 13, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, not if he or she is tempted, when. Every single one of us has been, is being, will be tempted. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God not, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So that's encouraging and challenging all at the same time. Because while he says that no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, there's a commonality. We all deal with similar temptations. If we took a moment to go around the room and say, what tempts you? You know, I mean, not that we're going to do that, but, uh, you know, that would be a little vulnerable, wouldn't it? Uh, but if you were to go around and say, this is what tempts me, everybody else would be going, really? That, that tempts me too. Now, there's going to be some things that might tempt you. It doesn't tempt the next person. But between all of us, we're going to cover all of them, okay? All of us are tempted to some degree. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God will provide a way out. That's the encouraging part of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So that when you are tempted, God will provide a way out. And that's the challenging part too. Because if, again, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says that God will provide a way out when we are tempted, then that means if we give in to temptation, we have not taken his exit door. And then we bear responsibility. Now, it's important to note as we're talking about this first point that everyone faces temptation. Temptation itself is not sin. By itself, it's not sin. Hebrews 4.15 says, Jesus was tempted in every way as we are yet was without sin. In other words, he didn't give in to it. We all fa face temptation. But then the question becomes, what do you do with it? How, how do you deal with it? Do you walk away from it? Do you give in to it? So all of us will be tempted to one degree or another uh, throughout the day because we're still creatures of flesh. Even though you might have a personal relationship with Christ when you get saved, your spirit is regenerated, but your flesh is not. So we still struggle with fleshly desires, fleshly appetites. And these are the things that we have to constantly be dying to self about. We have to be crucifying the flesh. We have to be taking up our cross, dying to self. And, and this is part of what James is talking about here in terms of a life of holiness. You know, wanting to honor God with the way that we live. And so, though we have no choice necessarily on when we face temptation, we do have a choice in how we deal with that temptation. So everyone will be tempted. But notice point number two, God is not the source of temptation. Uh, because he, he, he spells that out there pretty clearly, doesn't it? He, he, he says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So God's not going to bring some sinful tempting thing along your path, you know, to see what you're made of. You know, there are times that he tests us but not in a tempting way that would cause us to compromise our sin, ever. So that doesn't come from God. Where it comes from is our own desires. Uh, that's what he says in verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Now there are three things that work in concert against us, and I've said this many times over the course of, of pastoring here at Cornerstone. Our flesh, the world, and the devil. There are three things that are constantly working in concert against us. Our own flesh, our own sinful desires, the world, okay, all the stuff that the world promises, and the devil. But all of those are appealing. Those might be the source for our temptation, either my flesh or the devil or the world. All of them, though, appeal to my flesh. My flesh appeals to my flesh. The world appeals to my flesh. Satan appeals to my flesh. 
Remember when Satan tried to tempt Jesus into sinning? Uh, what, did, what did Satan always do? He was trying to tempt Jesus in the flesh in some way. You know, why don't you turn these stones into bread? It's tempting him, him physically, the hunger that he had because Jesus had been fasting. Why don't you, you know, throw yourself off, off of the pinnacle of the temple here? Why, take a look at all the kingdoms of the planet that I can give you. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Those are the entry points Those are the temptation points in our lives. And so God doesn't tempt us, but we have to deal with our own desires and and we have to rein those things in. And again, crucify the flesh, die to self. But I want you to notice with me, the third point is is that temptation is progressive towards death because he he talks there almost like it's a, a child that's being conceived. He uses this kind of language, verse 15, then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown, that gives birth to death. That's ultimately uh, what it leads to. So what he says about trials in, in the first part of chapter one, he says in a similar way about temptations here in this part of chapter one. So let me put back up again the progress, the progress of trials. It's testing, patience, mature and complete. So that's a good thing that comes out of difficulty. But then he also says temptation is progressive also. It starts with desires. Then, then we're enticed. So enticement then sets in. Then it leads to sin if we act on the temptation. And then ultimately the end game of leading a sinful life without repentance is death, and separation from God. So this is that progression. Remember, you see this progression. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it in your own life. You know how it unravels. But biblically, you see an example of this with the life of David, don't we? You know, when David committed adultery with Bathsheba, the Bible says that David was up on the roof of his palace one night in the the springtime when kings go off to war, which is where David should have been. But David had too much idle time on his hands, right? So he's up on the roof of his palace. He looks across the way, sees Bathsheba bathing. And so it goes like this. The progression goes, he saw, right? He looked at her, he saw, then he sent. He sent for her. He sent messengers, go get her, bring her to me. He saw, he sent, he slept, he slept with her and then he slaughtered her husband, right? Because he brought Uriah home off the battlefield, encouraged him to sleep with his wife. Why don't you go home? Give you a little R&R. You you need a little R&R here. You've been been battle weary. Uriah, this is like the the bro code, right? He's a warrior. Uriah is, is, uh, he's a soldier. He's like, "I, I can't enjoy my wife while my brothers in arms are on the field fighting and dying. And so David's like, okay, fine, go back to war. And David sends a note with Uriah to give to the general so that the general would put Uriah on the front lines so that Uriah would die. David's trying to cover up his sin because then he's thinking people will just think that Bathsheba's child is her husband's, but Uriah will be dead, so he won't be able to say anything about it, and nobody will know my devious sinful plan here, except God. God always knows what we're up to. And the progression led to death. I mean, Uriah's death and ultimately would have led to David's own death had it not been that he throws himself at the mercy of God and receives God's mercy and forgiveness. But notice the progression. He saw, he sent, he slept, he slaughtered. If he had stopped at just seeing, realizing the temptation, man, I gotta walk away from this. Even at the point of sending for her, He could have then sent messengers for and then realized, "Uh, this is ridiculous, this is wrong, this is sinful, and and recalled the messengers. He still would have been okay. But 
the progression of it ended up where he actually commits the sin. When he saw from the roof of his palace, you know, somebody once said, the same stairs that took David up to the roof of his palace were the same stairs to take him down. In other words, David got to a bad place, but he had the potential to exit the same way. You know, it wasn't this inevitable thing that had to happen. It was a choice that he made. This is the nature of temptation. This is what James is saying here. It's progressive. So the key for all of us is to recognize at the place of temptation, I got to stop. I can't go any further. I can't give in to this because then it becomes sin. Again, temptation itself is not sin. So that's where we have to deal with it. That's where we have to wrestle with it. That's where we have to realize I'm, I'm tempted right now. And listen, this is where the body of Christ can become a great strength and advantage to one another. Because if, you, if you're a guy and if, if you're married, maybe it can be your wife or if in some cases maybe you want another you know, buddy, another you know, brother in the Lord that you can call up. If you're a lady, same kind of thing. If you're married, maybe it could be your husband. Uh, maybe it could be you know, a, a lady friend of yours. That, that if we have somebody in our lives, be it a spouse, be it a friend, be it somebody, that in the hour of temptation, we can call and say, I'm struggling right now. Uh, you know, in Ephesians, Paul says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Do you, do you know when we disarm the power of temptation? When we expose it before it becomes sin. When we bring it into the light before it takes us captive. So, we have to deal with it at the level of temptation before it progresses to the ultimate, which is death. Verse 16, he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. By the way, when he says there comes down from the Father of lights, uh, I think NIV might say heavenly lights. In the original Greek language, it is the father of the lights. There's the direct article, the, inserted in the original text, the father of the lights. What he's talking about is the lights being the celestial lights, the sun, the stars. Okay, we know that moon is not a light source, but it reflects the light of the sun. So between the sun and the moon and the stars, James is just simply saying that God, the creator of all the celestial lights, he says he's the one who gives every good and perfect gift to us. He is the source of every good and perfect gift. And he says about him, James writes, there is no variation or shadow of turning. There, there's nothing shady about God. There's no variation. There's no shadow. In fact, John would write in 1 John 1, 5 that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's no darkness about God. And he, he's, he's about light and he brings things into light. He is the father of the lights. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. No shadow of turning with him. And in verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, circle the word first fruits. Let me just quickly explain first fruits. First fruits was actually a, a, a holiday on the Jewish calendar. And the feast of first fruits went like this. In the month of March and April is, is on the Jewish calendar when the, first of fruit, uh, when the feast of first fruits happens. And you would typically cut down, and it was often from the barley harvest. That was one of the earliest of the harvests in late March and, and early April. You would cut down some of the early stalks of the harvest. You would take it to the temple, give it to the priest. The priest would wave it 
in, in the presence of the Lord at the temple, and here's what it would indicate. On the Feast of first fruits, you were bringing the first part of the harvest to the temple of the Lord, and you were thanking Him for His provision, and the waving of the first part of the fruit, of the first part of the harvest, was in a sense saying, thank you for what you've given me, and I know there's more to come. There's more to come. There's more of a harvest. There's a larger harvest behind the first part of it. So they bring it to the temple of the Lord. They give it to the Lord that way. Now, check this out. Jesus rises from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. He dies on the Feast of Passover on the Jewish calendar. The Feast of First Fruits started, hear this, the day after the Sabbath following Passover. All right, Sabbath day on the Jewish calendar, always Saturday, right? Sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. So the day after the Sabbath following Passover, that's when Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose on Sunday, the day after the Sabbath following Passover. Jesus rose on first fruits. And in fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 calls Jesus our first fruits of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. And by saying that, what, what Paul meant was Jesus Christ rises from the dead, appears, and then he ascends into heaven. And Paul uses the analogy of first fruits because he says basically Jesus is the first of many more to come. That there were going to be others, aka you and me, who faith in Jesus Christ means we're going to get a glorified body too one day. We're going to go to heaven too. So Jesus is the first to rise from the dead. You say, wait a minute, other people in the New Testament rose from the dead. How about like Lazarus? Yeah, but Lazarus died again. Everybody who rose from the dead in a miraculous way in the Bible, either through the ministry of Elisha, Elijah, or Paul, or Jesus, they all died again. But when we get a glorified body, we never die, and we will forever be with the Lord. That's the kind of glorified body Jesus had. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Christ is like the first fruits of the dead, because we end up getting like he does, a glorified body. So when James here says, we're the first fruits of the creation, what he's saying is, We are among the believers who were saved, and there's many more to come. And here James is writing in the first century, and here we are now, all these centuries later, and we're part of the first fruits of his creation as believers. More to come. Here we are. Verse 19, he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, or slow to become angry, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, notice this with me here in verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, or slow to become angry. You've heard it said, right? That God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. He wants us to listen twice as much as we talk. So we should be swift to hear, quick to listen. You know, how are your listening skills? Communication is not just talking. We think when we hear communication, we think, I got to say something. No, you don't. It's better sometimes you don't say anything. Have you ever gotten into a situation where had you just kept your mouth shut, it would have gone better for you? Mm Mm-hmm. And so we should practice the art of listening. You don't need to speak unless it's necessary. Learn to listen. Jesus says we should be quick to listen, swift, or James says on behalf of the Lord, swift to hear, slow to speak. Write this verse down for those of you who are like, yeah, I really need to work on that. Psalm 141 verse 3, Psalm 141 verse 3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Amen? Some of you want to write that verse out. And put that on your mirror every morning when you brush your teeth. And you're going to read that. Psalm 141.3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. And then slow to wrath. Slow to become angry. Now, a riddle. What's the one thing that you can't get rid of by losing it? Your temper was the one thing you can't get rid of by losing it. Your temper. Now, yeah, no, uh, yeah, you just got it, didn't you? 
Um, I, I try to throw these out free of charge, and uh, yet some of you will get it on the way home. But anyway, what's the one thing you can't get rid of by losing it? Your temper. Now, not all anger is sin. We know this, right? Not all anger is sin. Jesus got angry at the temple when the people had turned the temple into a flea market. And so Jesus goes around with a whip and driving out the money changers, you know, which I think is a biblical precedent for why ladies, you should not make your husbands go to a flea market because Jesus didn't like it. <laughs> and there's a verse about it, but anyway. Not all anger is sin. God got angry, angry in the Bible. Numbers 11, verse 1, he got angry with the Israelites when they complained about their hardships in the wilderness. Numbers 11, 1 says, now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. And then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. So not all anger is sin. In fact, if you didn't get angry about a few things, there would be something wrong with you. You know, if somebody tried to or did harm your family member and you weren't angry about that, there's something wrong with you. If somebody falsely accuses you of something and you're not a little mad about that, there's something wrong with you. When something fails that you worked really hard at, and you're not a little angry, not all anger is, is sin. Anger is a pretty normal emotion. It's what we do with it that matters. When anger gets out of control, it becomes destructive, it becomes harmful. This is why Paul would write in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, he said, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let anger get to the place where now it is harmful, either to yourself or to others. And that's why he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. And by the way, explosive anger can be just as destructive to someone as implosive anger. You know, some people decide, I'm going to vent. That's how they show their anger. And that isn't right, the way that they just spill all over everybody. That's destructive. But so is implosive anger. You, you know the kind of people who, I'm not going to get angry. I'm just going to keep it all inside right until one day you 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 turn your implosion into an explosion because it's like you know it's like a coke bottle that gets you know shaken up at some point it's going to blow the lid you you can't you know just keep it all inside so we, we have to deal with anger we have to you know give it to god so that it doesn't become something that is destructive to ourselves or to others proverbs 14 16 and 17 a wise man fears the lord and shuns evil but a fool is hot-headed and reckless a quick-tempered man does foolish things Proverbs 29, 22, an angry man stirs up dissension and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. So we have to be careful to be slow to wrath. For the wrath of, of man, when a guy or a lady gets angry, does not produce the righteousness of God. Um, I only got like three minutes and I, I won't be able to do justice to the last section, so um, why don't we why don't we just park it there for tonight and pray for this much? I'm sure we have some work to do even on this much that we read. I know I do. How about if we just at least pray that the Lord would help us to be people who are quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. How about we just pray over that passage right there? That'll be good for us. Let's pray. Lord, we do ask that you would help us to be good listeners. Forgive us when we rush into situations talking so much. May we be good listeners. May we show respect to one another by the way we listen to them without interruption, without getting defensive, just listening. Help us to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Lord, set a guard over the door of our mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. May we be people who are restrained in our speech. And may we be slow to anger, Lord. And we understand that not all anger is sin, but a lot of times it sure leads to it when we don't properly take our anger to you. Lord, if there's someone tonight that just they have some pent-up anger, but I pray they would release it to you tonight. They would just confess it to you.
They would just say, Lord, I'm, I'm angry about something. And I don't want this anger to become something sinful that is destructive to me or to others. Take away my anger, Lord. Take away my anger. Help us, Father, as we live out our lives in such a way as to bring glory and honor to you so that one day when we're in your presence and you're distributing crowns, we'll be quick to lay them at your feet, thankful for you as our Father who loved us and sent his son Jesus to die for us. We thank you for your word tonight. Be with us as we go home. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.